Hello everyone and welcome to this bite-sized recording on counter schedules. My name is Amelia Heinem. I'm a junior at Farah's Building. Um, I practice uh, a mixed practice, so personal injury and also some public law as well. Um, I'm hoping that today we can just give a, a brief introduction to counter schedules, um, discuss some of the key issues for practitioners when faced with drafting a counter schedule. Um, and what I've done is I've just dropped my email at the bottom of the slide here. So if anyone does have any questions that arise from the recording at any point, then please feel free to drop me an email and I'll do my best to get back to you whenever I can. That's a genuine offer. Um, so please do take a note if, if you do want to, to ask any questions that arise from the recording. Now, the first thing to talk about is why why is this session important why are counter schedules important and frankly why are you watching uh, this bite-sized video i've set out in the first bullet point there um, a 2018 judgment from mrs justice yip now this highlights why schedules and counter schedules are important this was an appeal about allegations of fundamental dishonesty because a claim for care was unsupported by evidence um, and one of the key points which arises from the judgment set out on the slide there um, is to bear in mind that both the schedule and the counter schedule um, are written advocacy documents. And so care and attention should be put into those documents. In particular, in, in paragraph 27 of the judgment, uh, the judge says, it seems to me that the importance of the schedule of loss is frequently overlooked. This is or should be the document that draws together the presentation of the claim. It ought to be presented in an accessible and easy to follow format. Um, it continues to say this means that it should not simply be a series of calculations. It needs to be supported by sufficient narrative to explain the case being presented by the claimant. And I set out on, on the slide there further, paragraph 29, um, which I'll leave for you to read out. I won't read it out to you, um, but she highlights how essential schedules and counter schedules are. Um, and she compares in her judgments, um, the counter schedule, which was a very well drafted document setting out the defendant's case to the schedule of loss, which she'd previously explained as, as simply an, a number crunching exercise and, and a poorly set out schedule. Um, so it's important to just bear in mind that these are important documents and ultimately they, they might end up in front of the judge if, if the case doesn't settle and you go to trial um, and, and you don't want to be presenting something that doesn't really put your best case forwards. So when is a counter schedule required? I've just set out on the slide there, practice direction 16. Um, in particular, you can see it's paragraph 12.2 12 12 that's set out there. Um, in essence, we're looking at personal injury claims where the claimant has included a schedule of past and future expenses and losses. And that's what we're going to focus on for the rest of this short session. So turning on to the format of a counter schedule of loss, um, the most important thing is to make sure that it's user friendly. So in many instances, it might be convenient to follow the layout of the schedule of loss. That just makes it easy to follow for whoever is comparing the two and, and trying to determine what the relevant party's positions are. Um, however, when drafting a counter schedule, don't feel ultimately constrained by the schedule of loss and the structure. Um, it might be that there's, there's simply no logical structure to the schedule of loss and, and you think it's better to set it out um, in, in a different way. Um, and it might also be that you think there's a more user friendly way of presenting the information. Um, and if that is the case, then don't be afraid to deviate from the format of the schedule of loss. Um, what I've set out on the slide here are just six points that are taken um, from a practitioner's textbook on personal injury schedules. Um, and, and that textbook suggests the following layouts in terms of a counter schedule. Um, so the first point there is the introduction. So in any counter schedule of loss, make sure that in the introduction, you set out any abbreviations that you're going to be using throughout the documents. Um, that just helps to orientate the reader. Um, and it means there won't be frustrations later on when abbreviations are introduced and, and no one knows what they stand for. Um, also importantly, if liability is not admitted, make sure that you include a statement that any admissions are made subject to issues of liability. Sounds simple, but sometimes it's forgotten. 
Um, and also if it's provisional in terms of the council schedule of loss, then also make that clear in the introduction um, and set out what else is required in terms of evidence for the defendant to be able to finalize the council schedule. Um, the second point there, relevant data and information, uh, is, is useful to include all the relevant and data, sorry, all the relevant data and information. Um, so include the dates, so things like um, the claimant's date of birth, uh, the date of the accident. Um, and personally, I like to include them in a table at the top of the count schedule so that it's easy to comprehend um, and it's, it's easily digestible at the top of that document. Um, different people have different ways of setting it out, um, but I just think that's a very clear way of setting out the information for whoever's reading the count schedule and, and in particular a judge who might turn to the case and, and want to be able to digest the, the relevant dates um, and information very quickly. Um, in terms of the third point there, multipliers, um, again, my preference would always be to include another table or section setting out what the defendant says the correct multipliers are. I think that's eminently sensible. Um, and again, it's just a question of, of orientating the judge or the reader um, and making your position quite clear. Um, also, make sure when you're, when you're dealing with multipliers that you set out any issue as to life expectancy. The fourth point there, periodical payments. Um, of course, this is only if it's appropriate, um, but state whether there is a case where periodical payments may be more appropriate or whether the defendant contends for a lump sum. Um, it, it will depend on, on the context of the case, of course, whether you, you decide to include this fourth point. Um, but if, if you do take a position either way, then you need to make sure that you justify that position. So ensure that you summarize why that position is taken. Um, the fifth point there, the defendant's case in outline. The most important point on, on that fifth point is don't be afraid to include narrative when addressing each head of loss, particularly if, if the claimant is just what, what we might call a number crunching um, exercise, the claimant schedule of loss. Um, in, in the counter schedule, don't be afraid to include the narrative, to set out your case clearly. Um, you may want to, for example, summarize expert evidence upon which the defendant relies. Again, if causation issues are being raised, and it's helpful to raise that at the outset in terms of the outline of the defendant's case, um, as, as you should also raise any allegation that the claimant is malingering. Um, so don't be afraid to really set the scene in terms of um, where, the reader, where the reader is in, in, in basically understanding the defendant's case. It's, it's clearly going to be much easier for the reader to, to, to work their way through um, a, a well-designed narrative um, rather than, for example, ju just bullet points um, or, or a count schedule which simply just turns to each head of loss with um, a series of numbers and not much to say exactly how um, the author got to those numbers. Um, and of course, the sixth point that I put there is just the turn to each head of loss. Um, and I, I've just split them out onto the next few slides as general damages, uh, past expenses and losses, the interest, and then also the, the future expenses and losses. So if, if we just look at general damages, one of the top tips there is, again, it seems very simple, but focus on the medical evidence that's actually available. Um, so look at the medical reports in detail. Um, there are a number of things to check for. So um, quite often um, there'll be recommended treatment in the medical um, expert reports. Um, just double check if the claimant's actually under, undergone that recommended treatment. Um, and that flows back to the third point there as well. So to check for mitigation of loss points and if, if there are any and any concerns that the claimant has failed to mitigate um, in terms of general damages, then, then make sure that you do raise that in the counter schedule of loss. Um, and again, the fourth point that a lot of it will be included in, in the outline that, of, of the case um, point five that we spoke about before. Um, but make sure, again, that you just cross check for any inconsistencies. Um, I think a lot of the points on that slide are quite self-explanatory, um, but quite often there'll be, for example, um, a suggestion in the medical um, expert report, um, the most basic example being that the claimant undergoes physiotherapy um, and there's no evidence that the claimant has completed that um, and it's, it's quite often just not raised in the counter schedule of loss so do make sure that you're checking um, as, as you go through the medical expert reports and um, perhaps just have, it, have a checklist next to you um, and just tick off any areas of concern or, or, or where there might be any inconsistencies and equally where, where it's entirely consistent so you know you don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, turning to past expenses and losses, the, the first bullet point there, obviously loss of earnings, seek full and frank disclosure. 
So if you're dealing with a claimant who was employed before the accident or before the injury was um, incurred, then um, seek disclosure of wage slips. Um, it varies from, from person to person, but m most people, I think, probably um, take the average net pay for around the 13 week period prior to the injuries being sustained. Um, so sometimes it's useful to just follow that format. If you have more than that, then then there's nothing to stop you um, from, from going beyond that. And of course, a lot of it depends um, on, on the facts of the case as well in terms of um, where you might take loss of earnings and how far back you need to take things. Um, it might be beneficial to ask for a personnel file if a claim for loss of promotion is being advanced. Um, so it might be worth just considering that when you're working through the counter schedule of loss. Um, and also, obviously, if you're dealing with someone who's self-employed, um, then you want to be asking for business accounts and tax returns. The second bullet point there, past care. Um, so uh, uh, one that comes up quite often is um, a, a claim for care by family members will also include um, those family members um, who, are, who are just spending time visiting the hospital. Um, so make sure that you're on the lookout for that and discount that time. Um, and recall the tests as well. So gratuitous care must be well beyond the call of duty. Um, and so it's important to just really consider um, precisely what the claimant is claiming for on the schedule of loss. Um, of course, that's much easier if there is some kind of narrative in the schedule of loss. If it's simply numbers, um, then it's a little bit more tricky to, to, to deal with it in terms of giving any kind of reasoned response besides um, putting the claimant to proof um, as, as the need for the care. Um, and of course, the third point there, which is uh, sometimes forgotten, is to make sure that you apply the rate of reduction um, for gratuitous care. Third bullet point, travel and transport costs. Um, ask yourself if they're reasonably related to the claimant's injuries. Um, and a good test is to say, well, would these have been incurred in any event? Um, and that's the question to ask yourself when you're working through the schedule of loss um, and start to drop your own counter schedule of loss. Um, and another thing that's quite often forgotten is the second bullet point there. Um, under, under travel and transport costs, uh, which is that if, if you've got a claimant who's claiming, um, for example, quite frequently, you'll have the cost of a taxi to attend um, a medical appointment with a medical expert for the purposes of the litigation, um, then of course that, that shouldn't be forming part of the damages figure. It, it doesn't flow from the tort itself. Um, it flows from, from the litigation. Um, there are, of course, nuances um, to that in certain circumstances. Um, so, for example, if the claimant's going for a, uh, thinking out loud, but a, a CT scan, um, which is also to, to diagnose um, a particular area of, of the claimant's injury, as well as for litigation, then there are more nuanced questions there. Um, but as a general rule, it's just something to be looking out for. And the fourth point there, medical expenses and treatments, um, just uh, briefly, just ask yourself if it's supported by medical evidence. Um, but before turning to future expenses and losses, of course, you, you'll then need to calculate um, the interest on the past expenses and losses in any counter schedule um, and put that fairly. Um, and then you need to go on to consider future expenses and losses. Um, here, it, it's a little bit more of a, of a guessing game, as everyone will know. And it, it's, it's a question of responding to the estimates that are put forwards in the claimant schedule of loss. Um, but just two tips on, on the slide. So ensure that you consider the correct multipliers. Um, that should be easy because you should hopefully have set them out in the table at the start of the counter schedule of loss. I say easy, it's, it's not easy to work them out in the first place, but hopefully if you've set them out clearly at the start, um, that's not going to be a question of having to work through it all again once you come to, to this section. Um, and the second point there um, is, is, again, just to remember that exactly the same principles apply in terms of the future heads of loss. Um, and the burden of proof rests upon the claimant to establish the extent of his or her loss. Um, so when working through um, any future expenses and losses, just bear that in mind um, when you're looking at the schedule of loss and providing some kind of figures or some kind of response in the counter schedule of loss. Now, I hope that's been a useful introduction to counter schedules. Um, like I said at the beginning, my email address at the bottom there. So if anyone does have any questions, then please do let me know. Um, it's been a bit of a whistle stop tour, but hopefully um, it's given some kind of context and some points to think about um, for practitioners going forwards. And thank you very much for joining us today for the bite-sized session.